Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Blimey, Thank what are you, you all doing here on a lovely day like this? <laughs> <laughs> but obviously we're all geeks here, aren't we? I think we're all geeks, one way or another. So um, it's the gathering of the geeks. And it's a real pleasure to be here in this amazing space because you've got a beautiful cafe upstairs and then the secret back cave lined with comics. Couldn't be better, really. Um, so thank you for inviting me. We're glad to have you here with us, Paul. Uh -huh. So you know, for guys who don't know, Paul just give you a very short, uh, brief introduction to him. He has been a part of the comics industry for more than 30 years. And that's like an incredible amount of time, especially sitting here in India, you know, where comics has just been taking off now as an independent enterprise. But in these 30 years, com uh, Paul has run his own uh, independent comic magazine. He's published an anthology for like 19 issues. He's been the director of a music, uh, comics festival. He's curated comic exhibitions and stuff. So 30 years he's been there, he's done that. And hopefully today we'll be able to, you know, talk to him, get some information out, get some inspiration for us to speak as well. So Paul, I just want to start off by saying that, like I said, 30 years is a long time. Yeah, I'm very old. 30 years? <laughs> <laughs> I have this horrible portrait in the attic. <laughs> Picture, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but um, yeah, it's actually it's a bit sobering when you think that, yeah. I mean, um, I guess in theory there's, not, there's another Paul Gravette who got his law degree from Cambridge mm. because my dad was a lawyer and who basically took that route and said, I'm going to make lots of money, I'm going to be very successful. <laughs> I, in Britain, you may realise, in Britain, when, when you're a lawyer, you're either, you're either a solicitor, my dad was mm. a solicitor, who does all the kind of back, back, back right. of house kind of conveyancing and contracts, or you're a barrister. And a barrister is the guy that stands up in the court and makes all the big speeches and is very good. I think, as I have a quite a kind of theatrical background in my family, my, my mum was in uh, amateur operatics, she did musicals and shows, right. she was the star of those things. My grandparents on her side, my mother's parents, were both also really into music and uh, performing and acting. And I have a kind of, this, is, this isn't stressful for me at all. It ought to be, really, shouldn't it? Because I don't know, who, you know, but I could just, I'm very happy background. talking to people, basically, and mm -hmm. uh, performing a little bit, obviously. Right. Uh, so I think I could have become a barrister. But I didn't, because I was so passionate about comics, <laughs> I wanted to find some way of working in them. Right. Um, and I didn't quite know how I could do them, because I'm not, I'm not very talented at writing and drawing them. I did do, the, hmm. do that when I was young. I think everybody that loves comics, usually when you're in your about age 10 or 12, right. if, whatever it is, you want to make your own version of the comic you love. So I loved uh, Marvel comics especially. Um, and at that point, I was, I was a true believer uh, Excelsior, etc. <laughs> and I made up my own characters uh, and I drew them. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe this is my career, but I was never very good at writing or drawing, really. Right. But I think what, what I realized is that I loved the small press world, the indie press world. When I discovered that, after discovering lots of other things, that struck me as being this is where the new talent is coming from, Which are the and where books, new, uh, new which ideas kind of come from. from. Sorry? Which of these books specifically that you were inspired from? Well, you have to realize my, my, my history of exploring comics is kind of guess the point where yeah, each still. time. Should I speak a bit louder? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll project. Do you want us to move to the centre there somewhere? I can project. I'll project. I'm sorry, I forgot. Say if, I, if you can't hear me, just put your hand up and go. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the, my kind of idea about comics is that essentially you should never grow out of them um, and they should be able to talk to you through, through your whole life. And there's no sort of set model of saying, okay, you must like this at this age, or you must be this at this age. There's no reason why someone can't be reading Superman their entire life, right. or Amateur Trakatha their entire life. That isn't wrong, but as long as you're satisfied and fulfilled and you don't get bored. But I got, got bored rather quickly, and as my other friends did, and when we were reading British comics and then American comics, we sort of said, well, is this all there is? And once you start to, to, to question that, and then someone says, well, look, there's all this small press, underground, weird stuff coming out that is nothing like what you've read before. Or you discover there's a huge history of comics going way back, at least to the 19th century, which you've never seen before. You're like, what's that like? And then, of course, you discover manga. Uh, and my, my other lucky thing is that when I was growing up, I uh, learned French and German. So I could, I could read, my French is better than my German, but still I could read French comics, I could read German that comics, just up a whole and I went on holidays and my parents would luckily mm -hmm. took me to lots of places in Europe, so I was always buying stuff I couldn't read. So it basically meant that I never got bored, and I've never been bored since, um, because this art form is 
you know, look at it, it's just yes. splendid. There's something for everyone. But not everyone is like me, but I have, I have got this vision of saying, okay, I'm, I think everybody has a comet they could love, but they often haven't found it. Mm -hmm. ones, you know, they've, they've it's been turned off perhaps by some things, and it's, but it's there, we just have to find, put the, the reader and the book, the comic together, and they'll then start to enjoy comics. Yeah. You know, the way you're saying that your father was a barrister uh -huh. and no, stuff. No, solicitor. Solicitor. Solicitor, right? Yeah. Lawyer, so, yeah. how did he react to his mm, son? Yeah, I know. One day decide, hey, dad, you know, I want to be a comic I think, guy. I think if I'd been Indian, I couldn't have done what I did. <laughs> I couldn't have thrown away all my, but we paid you for you to get to college, <laughs> right. you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, well, I was very, they were very, my parents have always been incredibly supportive <laughs> mm. of, for me and my younger brother. My younger brother uh, works, has always loved um, technology and, and, and you know, design, and audio, that kind of thing. So we've had parents who are very supportive. That makes a big difference, of course. Yeah, but I think, um, I don't know if I made the right choice, but it, strangely what's happened, here I am talking about my mother, I'd be here in Mumbai <laughs> meeting you, you know who I am a little bit maybe, but the point is that uh, I kind of couldn't envisage where I, my, my, my work or my life would lead to, but incredibly it's coincided with so much opening up of comics. I mean, the world we're in now is obviously transformed by the internet hugely, right. but even back then, but pre-internet, you know, I used to type dozens of letters every day to people saying, send me a button, what's, what are you doing, what's your comic mm -hmm. like, do you want to send me your thing? I was always communicating, always reaching out and connecting people. Right. So you mentioned 30 years, the th key point I think for me, probably deciding to do something of my own comics was when I was stuck in a fairly boring job in insurance broking, um, <coughs> dealing with claims and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And I thought, well, this is, I, you know, I'm not really very fulfilled by this. Um, and I discovered all the small press, all the indie press, the stuff like you were showing me, the, so the, awesome. the small press stuff here, for example. And, you know, what used to happen, we used to have these big um, comic marts every month in a big hall in Westminster, Central, Central Hall Westminster, and it would be lots of tables of people selling their old comics or new comics inside plastic bags essentially and then people go around very quietly looking through with their checklists and finding the issue of spider-man they were missing and then every so often you get interrupted by someone saying hey i bought i brought out this comic mice will be mice please buy it it's only a pound and you go go away it's not i'm not interested and after a while i realized well, actually this is actually quite interesting but there's no place for them to sell right. so all i did was take a table and say bring your stuff to this table and from there this thing called fast fiction which was a kind of play on fast food and comics being you know, a lighter meal, if you like, um, grew because people had a, a thing to aim for. They made their new comics to come out for the comic mart and everyone met there and they could stand behind the table as well, but they could also just leave the comic. And we know really, most people, when you're making a comic, you want to make it, you want to draw it, you want to print it, but you don't really want to have to sell it. Because suddenly it's just like, oh god, it's so much work. So if someone says, well look, we have a table, put your stuff on the table and it might sell, then they go, oh that's, that's very nice, yes, and please, please have them. Uh, we also set up a thing called the Fast Fiction Info Sheet, this is all before the internet of course, where each month I would type up a little list of all the new titles that were going to be coming out that day, that Saturday. Mm -hmm. Um, with little covers and descriptions, and then we, because we stopped them, we kept the the, the the comics. We could send them out to people as a distro, a distribution service. So people, rather than sending off a pound here, a pound here, a pound here, you send ten pounds or whatever, and you would have it have all the titles, and we could send them out to you directly. Um, it was all very complicated, and we, and we, to be honest with you, we, we began doing it completely for free. You know, there was no commission. We didn't take any money off the price. But I'm afraid we had to start doing that. Otherwise, we'd <laughs> we couldn't make yeah, it work. The stalls that used to take up at these yeah. stalls and all, were those free, or did you have to pay for? Oh no, we paid, but they weren't very expensive to get a mm. stall. Yeah, but but we were the only. It was a very bizarre setting. We were the only table selling all this weird, small press stuff, mm. surrounded by people mostly selling old, rare comics, you know, uh -huh. American comic books especially. Okay. Yeah, especially. So but it, but so it took basically off. in this whole market of collectors, you guys yeah. are the only people who are pushing independent. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. This was in 1981 mm. when we started it. How difficult yeah. was it to get in touch with people? Mm. That I mean, right now it's fairly easy to get in touch with people. Yeah, you yeah, find yeah. Them online. Well, the, the, there's you a one. You have the emails. There was one really important um, critic kind of reviewer. Mm. There, was, there was a couple of fanzine magazines that were reporting on small press stuff, and this guy uh, Mal Burns, who was a big influence on me, because um, he was very open to European stuff and other stuff. Mm. He had he would give all the addresses. 
think. So I would you know, write all the letters out and go, hello, I'm doing this, and would you like to meet up at the Mart, or can you send your books through? Uh, so that was the route. It was, it was letters, and then obviously the, the network built up as people met up. And the great thing also was a social thing, because mm. you came, you met other artists, and then of course after the Comet Mart, like about four o'clock or so, we all went to the pub, and we all got we all did lots of drinking, <laughs> lots of talking about comics, and out of that, collaborations happened. So artists who were maybe struggling to, mm. you know, to do a story, writers who didn't have a, weren't very good at drawing, could meet up, and all kinds of new things came out. And from fast fiction, there was also a fast fiction magazine, there was an anthology that came out usually about once every two or three months, which put the best uh, of you know, new stories by the best artists into one anthology. And it was all photocopied, this is all photocopied. But there were people doing clever things. I mean, they would do hand-colored covers or uh, painted covers. Or one guy, we had, and we had some very famous names, of course, taking part in this. One of the big names that took part was Eddie Campbell. Well, Eddie Campbell, of course, is known now for, well, for co-creating From Hell, but also doing Alec and many other things. But he began his Alec things as little fanzines. And he made one very interesting comment that was all one long, continuous strip. It was like a, uh, a concertina thing where you opened it out and you kept opening out into a big long, one, one long, long horizontal strip. Yeah, yeah. And um, so there were experimental formats being done as well. So it was a, it was a very exciting time. And then at that period, also, uh, I got to meet my partner, uh, Peter Stanbury, who's been with me ever since, since mm. in 1983. And he came from the world of uh, very classy, glossy magazines. And, but he also was excited by comics, and especially by the, the talent that was coming through. We thought they needed, they needed a slightly more sort of upmarket, more confident showcase, one that sort of was a proper print magazine that was going to be on the newsstands. So that's where Escape came from. And he came up with the, the name, and that was like a different way of doing it, because it wasn't just, here are some interesting new artists from the UK small press. We also mixed it up with interviews, with features, and this kind of thing. But this was a, this was based. It was inspired by Raw. Hopefully, some of you have heard of Raw. Raw was Art Spiegelman and Francois Mouly's incredibly yes. innovative. We can afford this. And Peter had to learn how to do the hand separating of the colours because it was like a four colour printing to make the cover. And the format was um, we haven't got it here really, but A5. A5 is basically like you know half of this. So A4 folded to A5, uh, and we had wraparound covers. And we worked with a, a, a slightly dodgy printer, who didn't really do the job terribly well, it was on not very good paper. <laughs> and Peter was very disappointed because he wanted something looking much more professional, because he'd designed, done all the graphic design. We also met somebody, because we originally we were going to do the whole thing on a typewriter. All the text would be, just, would be was, was typewritten. And then we met a, a typesetter. And he said, he was a very nice guy, and he was very supportive. He said, well look, we can give you a good deal on the typesetting, you could get proper typesetting and look really smart. So that made a big difference. And for the first issue, we interviewed, uh, well, we, were at a comic, we were at a comic mart, and someone said, Serge Clerc is here. Now, that doesn't mean anything to many of you, but in 1981, Serge Clerc was a French artist drawing for NME, and he was drawing really fantastically stylish, cool, retro, 50s kind of style music graphics. And he was the... NME was the music magazine. It was Enemies of Musical Express, New Musical mm -hmm. Express, exactly. It was a big music magazine. So we thought, well, that's a great crossover artist, an artist that will bring an audience that likes his stuff in the music magazine. And yeah, we got to do an interview with him, um, and he does this brand new drawing, and that was a name that we could um, sell the magazine with. Right. So when we got the magazine through, that thing we did, we thought, because in, in Britain there's a tradition of giving away free gifts with the first issue, at least the first issue. So our free gifts, we printed uh, some color postcards that were in the middle uh, that were based on Bazooka Joe. Do you know Bazooka Joe? This is an American cult thing where you buy bubblegum and the bubblegum is wrapped up in a little tiny comic strip. Right. And they're um, pretty stupid, but they're quite fun. <laughs> we had an article about Bazooka Joe comics and we had an, a very interesting artist called Shaky Kane, hmm. still around now, very clever, who did, a, did new versions of Bazooka Joe. And that was the free gift inside. And then we get, we made a badge. We put a big a, a badge to give away. And um, we didn't have any distribution plans at all. But fortunately, we got a lot, a ridiculous amount of press coverage. I mean, just ridiculous. I mean, it was a tiny thing, but it was something that Britain needed right then. There right wasn't then, anything else like it on the market. There wasn't anything that. around, and we had a lot of support from, particularly the rock mm -hmm. music journalists, mm -hmm. were very supportive of it, um, and we got. You know, style magazines like The Face and Blitz that were around at that time. It was a very, very cool period of kind of like post-punk, 
kind of new wave. That was the whole kind of style of the whole thing. Um, so it, 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 we were very lucky. And a distributor got in touch and said, well, we supply comic shops. In fact, there were two distributors. It was Titan, still going, and Knockabout, which is now just a publisher. They were both distributing to different places. And they said, we can help you get the magazine out there. So you can imagine it wasn't terribly well planned. You know, we print a thousand and go, what do you do with these things now? We could sell them from our one little table at the comic marts. But uh, so, and from there, escape gradually developed over the years. How did you end up selling all that first thousand? Uh, well, a lot of it was from mail order, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you get a good write up in a, in, in a newspaper and they give the address out, you can right. see people were sending in their money. And we actually built up subscriptions because, in the end of the first issue, we put an advert for the next one saying, issue two of Escape will have 3D. We didn't know how we were going to do it, but we'd just seen 3D printing and thought, we've got to do 3D, okay. So, uh, and at the time, we'd also, we'd bought ourselves a, a PMT camera. Now, PMT does not mean premenstrual tension. It means <laughs> photomechanical transfer, and it's a syst chemical system, very messy system for, you know, you can put, in it, you can put something on the top of it, top of it and it photographs it and then it makes prints it out as a, as a smaller or bigger image that you can then print out and use for your layouts. Now we're talking this is all pre-computer, really prehistoric system where you have to kind of you know stick bits of yeah. type down and bits of letter set and uh, it's very very you messy. Really the pages and the it's very hands-on, it's mm. very high touch, not high tech. Um, but it was actually a great way to work. We had a little sort of basement studio where we were living. The guy had a basement that was empty and said, well, mostly empty. So we said, can we use this as our, our studio? So we had that. What happened when we get to, the, get to the second issue, though, we started to figure out the money. And the problem was that we, didn't, we could only actually afford to print the cover because we had, didn't have enough money at all. I mean, the money, we hadn't had that many sales. We sold maybe a few hundred or so, but we hadn't sold the thousands. So we said, well, but you can imagine the problem because at the time, this is again pre... This is 1982, 83, or something like that. 82, 83, 82 it began, actually. 83, we did the second issue with 3D in, and um, we, ha we didn't have our own phone. We, had, we were in a, a flat, and a, a block of flats, and the only phone we had was one of these uh, coin phones. <laughs> you have to put money in. So, you know, you would go, I'd be on the phone, I'm going, hello, I'm calling you from this really trendy new magazine, Escape. I wonder if you'd like to advertise. It only costs beep, 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 beep. And you go, I perform. I think it would really kind of shatter the illusion a bit that we were this glamorous magazine. Because actually, that's what we were trying to do. We tried to pretend from the beginning that we were bigger than we were. I mean, one, just as an example of that, my brother lives in New York. I have a good friend in Paris. So we put London, Paris, New York, on, uh, wow. as if we had offices, we had offices in the, as if we were. So we were kind of pretending to be more than we were. Um, but we did sell advertising, and we did get subscriptions, and we did achieve 3D. That was the incredible thing. We, uh, had, we found two perfect strips that weren't made for 3D, but when you put them into 3D, they really sort of worked perfectly. They were all to do with, one was, was called Selector Vision. It was all about how you can, you, uh, it was basically, there were stories that worked as 3D, 3D things. Did you actually give up 3D glasses? We did. We bought 3D glasses, and we spent, quite a few evenings literally sticking in little tiny plastic bags to slip the, 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 the glasses inside, yeah, yeah, we did that. And we met this most amazing guy called Arthur Gerling, who was a real eccentric, uh, who was the president of the Stereoscopic Society, who advised us how to do it. Because you may not realize how, how you do 3D you know, pre-digitally, is you have to, you, you make a, you make um, a scan, a PMT, a, a, a printout of the artwork onto acetate and you make several <coughs> of them and you actually divide them into layers and the further back, the further back that the image receives, the more it moves out of line. You know, it's red and green basically combined. But we got up to about 12 layers on one image with, just by dividing it all up. It means painting out the rest of the image to, to, to disguise it and then you let the other rest of it come back. So, but you can imagine, we're going, this is going to work, but we had this wonderful old guy, Arthur Gerling, who knew everything about 3D. He advised us, advised Peter how to do the technical stuff. We moved to a better printer, nicer paper, and I can remember they sent us the proofs through of the 3D, and thought, oh my God, is it going to work? And he put the glasses on, it. it works, fuck, wow, look at this. So, and no one, I think no one in Britain had done 3D comics, I mean, not, not since the 50s, and at the time there was a huge revival of 3D. In mm -hmm. fact, there was more 3D comics done in the 80s down the 50s, especially in America. So I'll let you get a question in now. <laughs> <laughs>
Sorry. <laughs> really come out with these kind of magazines. Yeah. It's very difficult for you to come into a fact that you will actually be able to come out with a second issue. Mm. If you come out with one issue, you don't know, you put all your money in it. You don't know if it's going to sell out. Absolutely. You don't know if you're going to invest that money into a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you guys get the confidence to actually go out and ask for subscriptions and take that? Yeah. News? We just had the chutzpah, I think. We had the chutzpah mm. to do it. But I think we did think that there's this... Yeah, we, and of course, it's, there's a... There's a there's a pressure once you have people going, okay, we paid for the next four issues of right. oh my god, we've got to do, do some more. So that does keep you, does drive you on a bit. Mm. Um, and I think also just the fact that we seem to be there at the right time where something was coming together. The point is that you can't manufacture or engineer a scene or a community, but I'm sure you have it here in India. You've got it with all these fantastic talents that are, that are now doing stuff, but they may be a bit scattered. They're probably connected via Facebook and internet. But you know, back in these days, you, 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 you can't make it up. But when something genuinely comes together and you've got this very diverse but connected group of creators, it can create something more right. um, and the, this was a, a period with fast fiction and escape when essentially British comics moved away from being uh, just for kids or just for comedy or just for adventure characters there was a, or, or obviously at that time you had things like 2000 AD that was right, amazingly right, right. important but the fact was that this was another way of doing it and we were looking at uh, comics from all, all around the world to say what what are the other ways what are the different ways of doing it? you know how, how closely was the editing process for escape magazine was it like yeah. a, really you were completely open to the contributors to kind no, of we were very hands on we were very we were uh, Peter and I were very very hands on mm. i think people there's a the challenge of that is an interesting question because actually the edit the editing mm. of comics is actually an undervalued skill I mean, it's a very important part which doesn't often come in that much i get the impression that quite a lot of uh, certainly a lot of quite a lot of french comics for example they're not edited very much because the artists are seen as the great auteur we must allow him to spend the next three years painting one page <laughs> um, and then when it comes to american comics well there are editors there of course they tend to be more controlling the storylines the big events making sure everything fits together but they're also tremendously driven to go okay they're, they're more like traffic managers they've just got to get the stuff's got to be made just keep drawing keep inking where it's a whole kind of conveyor belt thing the best editorial uh, approach I've come across is in manga and we don't always realize that if you've read Bakuman you do realize just how important editors are then they are crucial absolutely crucial uh, and there's a there's a danger there because then of course editors actually become too controlling too demanding they actually don't allow a creator to really let cut loose with something experimental they the editors may be too commercially driven maybe yeah I do have a few we have like a Edition. We should do something with them, you're right. I mean, people have asked, well, you know, maybe put them out digitally in some way, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, the magazine went, you went right, went for 19 issues, but the first uh, eight, is that right? Yeah, the first eight, is that right? I'm trying to think now. Maybe seven? God, I can't remember now. Eight, no, it's eight. What happens with anthologies, they have a natural life, by the way. Uh, they basically all get too big. And that because you're kind of committed to certain artists, hopefully you want to help someone develop their career, but then new ones come along and you just get to having to have a giant issue to get everybody in. And then you kind of have, a, have some kind of crisis of what do we do next with this magazine if it's just going to get bigger and bigger. Um, and we went from an A5 size, the big step we took, to going to a magazine size, mm -hmm. which is basically like this, but kind of slightly shorter. We, we modeled it on Love and Rockets, for example, or Weirdo magazine, all that, that kind of format. And that was also because we wanted to be able to publish uh, comics from Europe especially full size you know to do them justice you couldn't squeeze them down small and also because we were by that point I hadn't mentioned by that point we'd already changed a lot because we'd actually um, moved with issue five or six, maybe six, I can't remember now, maybe six, six we moved to having full color covers in other words, not, not hand-separated, but actually a fully painted cover. And the cover was amazing. Issue 6 of Escape's cover was painted by Andy Dog, who is the brother of Matt Johnson from the band The The, or The The, you might know about them. He's got a fantastic style. It was a really strong cover, bloody hell incredible piece of work um, and we had separate you know fully separately covers I know that sounds very ordinary to you probably but it was very you know you've got you've got full color covers on your magazine here which are fabulous but the fact is that back then we hadn't we'd had to separate it all and then um, the, so the, the, the big step definitely was moving to the larger format and we also got the magazine onto the newsstands right I was about to ask you that yeah. was that a factor in your 
position, I mean, most new yeah, in the end, in the end it was. I mean, in a way, if you have an A5 magazine, you right. could argue actually it stands out in a way because mm. when a news agent gets it, they put it in front of other things, mm. so it actually doesn't get hidden. And that can be, and it's quite you know, cute and looks different from the, from the standard one. Right. But we thought, you know, we need to have a more serious, you know, full-size magazine, so that was a, definitely a factor. Um, and at that point, uh, we also doubled the price. Okay. We went from 95p to £1.95. Oh my god, it's so <laughs> scary because well, everything's costing more. And also, I haven't mentioned the other thing we had to do. We felt pressure to start paying the artists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was because, because we discovered, not discovered, but we promoted these artists from doing their free mm -hmm. stuff in small press into Escape, other publishers were going, oh, these are quite good, these guys. We'll, 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 come, we'll put them into our anthologies, because uh -huh. there were other magazines, like Knockabout, it comes right. especially, was the, was the anthology, we'll, and we'll pay them. Mm. And we started to go, oh my god, we're going to lose this, let's lose the, we didn't, we're going to lose the artists, but we felt we were going to lose the artists. And also we wanted to kind of, we weren't, we weren't making much, we weren't getting any money out of this, really, but, but, at all, really. It was all going back into the magazine, but we felt we must somehow budget. So we had advertising money coming in, we had sales, we had subscriptions, we must pay them something. So um, that, and also, of course, we had to pay for the, the French stuff, or right. the European stuff. We had to pay something for your rights to that. Licensing fee. Licensing, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it made sense to do that. Um, so when the magazine took off in that format, it reached a lot more people. Uh, he designed a whole typeface. Um, and it was all playing around with the, the E had not just as in one, two, three, it had four horizontal things. So it's one, two, three, four. It was like an extra line. And everything had like an extra bit attached. It looked slightly manga y, slightly just very graphic. And it was a very strong logo, and I think it worked really good. Really, really, really. So you always stuck to publishing magazines. You never thought of releasing like single issues of comics, standalone issues. Well, we did actually, from that point, we did actually, uh, around that time, so I don't actually know what it was, but we did actually have our artists, several artists that we published that we thought could do a graphic novel. We were doing them already, in fact, in, in part. So Eddie Campbell, who I've mentioned before, was the one that we really got behind. So we published three of his um, graphic novels, although they were, didn't have spines on them, they just had, uh, they were sti they're stapled. stapled. Um, and, and that was Alec. And we thought Alec was one of the most amazing, brilliant, um, real-life autobiographical comics ever. Um, I can remember when we first contacted uh, Eddie Campbell because he was living down in South End. That's not. I'm, I'm from Essex, so I'm an Essex boy, and uh, all my. And we just saw his stuff. In, in, and and uh, this is before fast fiction. Even we saw his stuff and thought, this is amazing, because what he was doing, he was using Letraset. Now that doesn't mean anything to anyone, perhaps, but Letraset is like you know, dots, dots on rub down sheets. And, but he was making a kind of almost impressionist kind of effects with them. He would kind of layer on bits of, bits of dots to create these kind of different patterns. And his stories were very real life, very poetic, great writing. Just thought, this is something we haven't seen in British comics. He was kind of like a, a British Harvey P. Carr or right. Robert Crumb in a way. He was self-published at that time. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was doing that. And with his main project, Alec, was, uh, is an, an autobiographical thing, but disguised. And we thought uh, we should do this in a book form. Mm -hmm. So when we brought out the first Alec collection, we did something that no one really had done, certainly in Britain before, was we got, the, by that point, the two big names in British comics were Alan Moore, obviously, and Brian Bonnet, mm -hmm. obviously. Well, it turns out that both Alan and Brian loved Eddie's stuff, and they gave us great quotes and a great introduction, so we put the, the book out with, with their names on the cover as well, and that obviously helped to sell, right. sell that. So, I mean, if somebody's not a fan of Eddie Campbell, if you're of, like, Alan Moore or something, they would be willing to take a risk on it. Yeah, exactly. It gave the endorsement of it. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So we did three of those, um, and then we also um, had other other books in, in, that came along. Um, there was Doc Chaos, there was a kind of sci fi conspiracy thing, and there was. Uh, Oh yeah, um, Alex and Ali, which was another, another um, sort of kind of like British Love and Rockets, you know, two very sexy girls having adventures. So these were all in the same format as Escape, but but so they weren't they weren't didn't have spines, but they had uh, they were standalone one offs. Yeah, exactly. All, all. So how did Escape finally end up winding down? Well, was we, it like a natural life cycle, or at I some guess point you wanted more? We uh, we had, um, but they knew they had to try and find you know the next stuff. What's what's what is the new stuff that's coming in? 
So, um, and they were aware that we we were finding the stuff. We were finding the, the exciting new new work that was coming in. So they gave they offered us a deal. It wasn't a very good deal at all. But <laughs> we'd never made any money doing it ourselves. And they said, well, we'll pay you to, to be the editors, mm -hmm. and then we'll be your publishers. Um, and the, the, it was basically one really fairly poor salary divided between two people, <laughs> basically, to do everything. Uh, and they, in theory, did marketing, and but mm -hmm. they didn't do very much marketing, really, but in theory they did. But that did give us the, an, a whole new way of doing the magazine. It meant that we could actually bring it out a bit more frequently, because it only came out about three times a year, maybe. But with them, it came out more like five times a year. Um, and <coughs> it just gave us that extra kind of security to go, okay, let's, let's really push it for this one. Because our goal was to take Escape onto, you know, to get national distribution on the newsstands. And we did get a distributor offering to do it, at least test it in the London area. And when we did that, we got very good sale, sell through. We sold about maybe 60, 70% of the issues sold, which is actually, they were quite encouraged. The distributor saying, this is working, it's really good. We should try rolling it out across the country or certainly in the main cities like Manchester and maybe Birmingham or wherever. But the publisher, this is Titan Books, they, the word in their name is books. They were a book publisher. They're now a very important magazine publisher, but at that time they weren't doing magazines. And they, the word they didn't like was that it was it was sale or return. And the worry for uh, uh, for many comic publishers is that when you step outside the comics market, where it's all firm <laughs> sale in a comic shop, mm. then you get the risk of stuff coming back that hasn't sold. Unsold stock. Unsold stock. And obviously we weren't selling 100% of what we was was going out. And right. that is a very mad equation. The whole thing about the business system of publishing where you print way more that you hope to sell yeah. but you only sell maybe half or maybe less and what happens to all the rest of them they get pulped or they get returned and you go I don't want them back um, so it's not the best system really it's, it's a flawed system but they, they chickened out I think I mean I don't blame them because actually it, it was a very big risk it wasn't what they what they were used to doing but we got disappointed obviously to say the least we were quite angry about it we thought that you know, so but we thought we had a great concept still so we did develop a next phase of escape so it was a whole a different logo mm. it was going to be a very glossy magazine it was going to have a lot of bought in material in color from Europe it was going to be a men's magazine particularly that kind of angle it was going to be like kind of like face the face with comics, I suppose, a bit like that. A, we should do a comics magazine, and he and uh, we we talked to him at exactly the right point where he said, I, we want the, and it was the one, the one magazine idea at this at this uh, brainstorming sort of workshop that everyone said, yeah, this ought to work. It ought to be a really, he was a magazine publisher of motoring magazines and that kind of thing for me. Right. So that almost took so off. So it was very tantalizing. Like, it was a frustrating time because mm -hmm. we just thought we could do this because we looked at uh, especially at heavy metal obviously in right. America but also uh, magazines in France like Asuivre and Metal Elan and well, magazines from everywhere mm -hmm. and this was a time when there was more space in comics culture for anthology magazines uh, and newsstand ones especially in France for example yeah. but in Spain in Italy we looked at them all and they were all very inspiring now that's not around we're not in a but the newsstand is not a place you go to, cool. to find ex experimental anthology comics so so that didn't happen and that was a, a big setback um, I didn't I bounced back very quickly Peter didn't bounce back so quickly he got really quite down about the fact that we couldn't make that work um, but yeah but in a way I think um, we, we that escape generation has had already changed British comics we'd already done the things set out to do which is and I'm assuming by that time you already had provided. other Mac new stand to fill that void. Yeah, yeah, of course you had Warrior magazine was out at the time. You had yeah, many other ones were around. His deadline came along just as we ended. Deadline took off with Terrible Girl, especially that was a little bit. So yeah, there were other opportunities. So was that on the time you started writing for other publications? Well, I guess my next kind of evolution really was doing um, was exhibitions. Well, next thing, because uh, because of the overlap, I've been to Angoulême. Have you heard of Angoulême? Right. Yeah. Some of you have. Some of you haven't. Angoulême is like yeah, just. You have to go. It's just like it's like the mecca. It's the mecca. It's the Frankfurt. It's the can mm -hmm. of comics. Except it's in winter, so it's not like can really. But um, it is a fantastic festival. So inspiring. I know some people have been, and I go. I've been going every year since '84, and it, you come. You just. It's my. It's the new year. I mean, it's my new year. You have. I know you had New Year on Friday yeah. here for some people, <coughs> but my new year is Angoulême because you go there and you go, wow, look at this incredible culture, and it's not. 
When I first went, it was very... I remember we met the director. He's, my, my name is uh, Pierre Pascal. Uh, we are running the very, very international <laughs> exhibit, uh, festival. I said, well, that's, yeah, I can speak a little bit of French, fortunately, but the fact is it wasn't very international. We were the first <laughs> British people who'd wow. ever been to mm -hmm. Angoulême. It was almost all French language, and it was, it was, it, it, it was a bit like that. Interlope. A little bit, mm -hmm. a bit. And I think over the years, it really has opened up. It really has become more and more international, and uh, it's now... The, the most extraordinary place to meet and connect, so yeah, I love it. Um, and I was lucky to start doing a few things for them. Um, I went as a journalist originally, so that when in 1990 they wanted to do a British year, they knew me as someone that knew about British comics, and they said, well, why don't you, can you, can you curate an exhibition? I'd never curated an exhibition before at that point. Um, and it was going to be in this incredible new building they were opening. It's called the Centre National de la Bande Dessinée et de l'Image. It's the National Comics and Image Centre. Spectacular, very modern, exciting bit of architecture. Um, and it's going to be opening that, that festival in 1990 by Jacques Long, who was the, the big Ministry of Culture. He was, you know, he was a very trendy guy. It was a whole period when comics in France were being kind of taken up by the by the culture right. gurus and the culture, 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 culture I suppose and uh, yeah there's a lot of funding behind them and and it was the most amazing project because uh, it was the biggest exhibition ever been done on British comics you know, we had all this stuff that no one ever put together right and right at that time of course France was discovering Watchmen France was discovering Vita Vendetta mm -hmm. France was discovering Brian Bolland's you know, Alan Moore's Killing Joke and all these incredible because at that point, of course, we'd come through the 80s when so many British artists and writers just basically completely revitalised the American superhero comics industry. I mean, apart from a handful of people, like, obviously like Frank Miller, mm. I think if it hadn't been for the British invasion, the, the Brit pack coming in, I think well, American comics might not have actually survived, actually, because they, were, they needed something. And I think what the British brought was, you know, we didn't, we weren't completely... Um, convinced by superheroes. <laughs> we didn't believe in them. We kind of distrusted them. That comes through certainly, I think, in Alan Moore's take on them, of course. Because we had that kind of outsider perspective on American society, you know, we, uh, we're aware of it, but we also have a, that, that distance, it means that we can actually, you know, British creators can actually comment more darkly and more, 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 more edge and more bite. Um, we weren't, that's what we really added to it. And of course in 2000 AD, um, we had just the most amazingly dark science fiction stuff. I mean, stuff that was so satirical and funny, black humour, ironic, again, dystopian. I mean, very, again, very British, really. I mean, it's not something that you would find that easily in America. So these ingredients all generated a lot of excitement about the UK. And I can tell you that the, the arrival of the British comics um, kind of entourage. We had big names. We had Alan Moore was there, Jamie Hewlett from Tank Girl, he was there. Lots of enormous names came and I was in charge of these, these people, trying to be in charge of these people. And of course it was just a huge clash of cultures because the French, their comics world is so sophisticated and artistic and uh, and everything. And the British come in and they're all kind of, well they're mostly kind of thugs or, or right. kind of just crazy drinkers or just, so and you can't manage them very easily. And there's a different just a very different world. So I think it was the most, it was the most unforgettable festival. I think Angoulême hasn't really recovered right. since Britain was the guest country. Really. You're responsible for that. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. So it was how was the responsible uh, uh, response to the first exhibition? I mean, for yeah. them, it is like access to a new culture. Mm. So did they look at it as some kind of infestation that, hey, you know, here's the period of our comics being infested by this? Or were they open to the. That's a good question. Culture? Yeah, I mean. Um, well, I don't know, when, when a lot of the French, when a lot of the American stuff was actually published in France, because it's mm. published in their big hardback album format. Right. So it's not put out in a little little pamphlet. Mm -hmm. And um, no, they were really, they were very very positive about it. I think, uh, generally speaking, I mean, um, the the period I think was an important one for again for French comics themselves, where they've been in the, in the doldrums during the um, 80s. They become rather stale and rather um, repetitious. And they need something new. So the, the British and American stuff that was coming in at that point, again, re, uh, gen regenerated um, French comics. And of course, at that same period, you have the arrival of Dragon Ball and the right. arrival of, of manga, which again, was seen as definitely much more of an invasion, much more of a worry to the mm -hmm. French. But again, has completely revitalized uh, 
comics there too. Yeah. So yeah, so if we just jump to the future a little bit. Yeah, because we, we, we could be here all day, couldn't we? <laughs> I was thinking, we've only got to about 1990. <laughs> we've got 30 fucking years to talk about. <laughs> yeah, okay. And it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I don't mind sitting here and having like all day discussion. No, no, but these guys have got to have a break at some point. And no one's had a chance to say anything to me at all. Because I was the joke was, it's going to be a conversation. And you realise that I, 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 I barely, barely pause for breath. No, I think once you finish talking, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the people out here will also have a lot to yeah, talk to yeah. you about. Uh -huh. So, you know, I think if we jump to the present right now, uh, you're just putting up your exhibition, which is the 100 women in... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine something like that is a huge responsibility to take on, you know? Uh -huh. In fact, out here you're saying, okay, these are the 100 women whom I believe... Well, well are this is the way Indian people think about this mm. exhibition, being rude. But when it was written about in the Mumbai age, mm. Mm. we, Deb Kumar, I forget his surname now, Chitra maybe? Deb, Deb Kumar somebody, anyway, wrote the, an article as if, as if the exhibition is the 100 right. best women comic artists of all time. Well, it's not the 100. It's 100. It's mm. a 100. And it's very, just a survey, just a quantity of what's going on there. And that was the only way we could manage it. If you, if I would never, I've, I've done a thousand and one comics, and that, right. what, that again was not really the one thousand and one. Oh. It's just the, the book title starts with a thousand and one, not the one thousand and one. But it was a thousand and one comics you must read before you die, which put a certain pressure on <laughs> what to put in. Um, but yeah, th but these kind of lists, with, with the women's show, the reason we did this uh, was that um, there's a very exciting new gallery, it's not very big, but dynamic, uh, called House of Illustration, which, which we really need in Britain, I mean, in London especially, space for illustration of all kinds. But they've been going since July 2014, they were founded by Quentin Blake, a very famous children's book illustrator, um, and they've done some very, very nice shows, but they were very nice. Shows. They were very kind of safe and they were good, of course they were good, but um, well, everyone there is just mad about comics. I, think, I mean, they, they, they're all saying, we want to do comics. To, and, and they've been waiting till the chance to do comics. And they contacted me and said, we want to do a comic show in six months. So this was January of last year, so we want it for like June, July, and we want to do something on women. I said, well, okay, I could help you, but it's terribly short notice. Um, and have you not thought about it very much? We would have just probably taken the easy course, which would have ended up with an exhibition that is mostly based around autobiography, because autobiography is the big genre that women have excelled at. They haven't invented it, of course, they've co invented it. You have Aileen Kaminsky, Robert Crumb's wife in the 70s, the same time as Justin Green, and of course, Robert Crumb himself doing autobiography for the first time, really seriously. Do you have some other thoughts on why that is? Well, women, I think it's partly because they've probably not really been allowed to work on other genres as much, but also perhaps because um, their stories are th stories that we don't hear. I mean, if their experiences have been excluded from many other media, how many TV shows or films do you get to hear about it? So it meant that that's where the, 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 the comic genre allowed them a, a space to be able to express that. But we didn't want to present a, a show of, of comics by women if it was all or most autobiographical because it would kind of make people go oh well that is that's what women's comics are women's comics are like in that box so we set up from the beginning to um, try and cover many genres so we have superhero we have erotic we have humor incredibly funny comics we have um, reportage documentary historical I mean every uh, every kind of subject and then that way to demonstrate that women can and are doing every kind of subject and don't want to be boxed into one thing and then from there um we open the exhibition with pioneers we came up, came up the, the word as you see it's the exhibition is called comics creatrix so i don't know if, if you're I don't know if you're like me but i like new words and words that you can kind of drop in so a creatrix is a female creator and everyone I say it to them, they say, oh, you mean like dominatrix? No, 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 no. <laughs> like like um, aviatrix or proprietrix. But it's a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a Latin thing. You turn the tour into a trix. But then when we came with the, the idea of having an, an opening section of pioneers, I thought we could call them pioneeresses. I'm a pioneeress. Well, you could like air, heiress, actor, actress, but we didn't use that. But um, we showed about sort of 30 or so really interesting pioneers, women pioneers of comics. And these were not just British, they were also from America, from other countries, from, from Germany, for example. And we also went right back to two very early ones, 
to really kind of underline that women have been you know, just pushing at the comics from the beginning, one of them, the earliest one we found, is a woman called Mary Darley, and she and her husband, Matthew Darley, used to run a print shop in the 18th century, around sort of 1760, 1770, in London, doing satirical prints. Often they were multi-panelled, uh, and they were often obviously very topical and controversial. And she, they didn't just print them, she and her husband both drew their own. The complication is, <laughs> as you may have noticed, you've got Mary Daly and Matthew Daly, and they both signed them MD, so we don't always know whose is whose. But we know that she was making them. Even more interesting, she also made the first kind of little guide as to how to do caricature. At that time, at that point, that was the, the new term for cartooning was caricature. The whole idea of you know distorting the face and um, being slightly insulting and this kind of it was actually almost it was like a, a social pastime. You would you would uh, it was done within sort of high society. It was quite a cool thing to do. So she was the first how-to manual on comics was done by a woman in Britain. And then a century later, another Mary, but actually Marie, Marie Duval, she has a French name. Her real name actually was Isabelle de Tessier. And I, for a long time I've been thinking, well, she must be French. But everyone assumed she was French. Uh, but actually she was London. She was born in London, in Marylebone. And she married the creator of a character called Ali Sloper which means nothing to us, but at the time, this is around the 1880s, 1890s in Britain, the, the magazine that he appeared in, which was called Ali Sloper's Half Holiday, was the biggest selling cartoon magazine in the world. I mean, it was extraordinary. It would sell up to half a million copies every week for a penny. Um, and the character was merchandised, there were movies, there were musicals, um, there was even, we showed an exhibition I curated two years ago, there was even, um, there were ventriloquists who had like models of, of Ali Sloper that they would perform and one of them survived and we exhibited this extraordinary, terrifying looking <laughs> ventriloquist doll. Um, and Ali Sloper basically is a kind of, he's East London, so he's an East End rogue. His name, Ali, is short for Alexander. Sloper means he slopes as he sneaks down the alleyway to get away from people he's tricked. He's a trickster, basically. And if you look at him, he reminds you, if you know the actor, the comedy actor of W.C. Fields, with his big nose and he's always a bit drunk. Well, he's that kind of character. But he was hugely popular. And, and what's brilliant about it is the reason it sold so well is it, it was it could sell across all the classes. You could, you know, from the very, very bottom to royalty and the prime minister would read them because it was satirical and funny and and just completely engaging. Uh -huh. You don't miss out on someone from some region. You don't end up, you know, focusing on one place. Did you never think to scale back and maybe do like a hundred women in UK? Well, we could have done that, but it would have mm -hmm. been. It ended up. It ended up around 50-50, 50, 50, 50 mm -hmm. UK and fifty international. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you can't tell the story. You can't tell the big stories. It's a bit too insular if you just right. literally just do just the UK only. Um, and quite a few of course of these artists from around the world are published in English or in or in even in Britain. So that was a reason too. But it turned out that the reason why the show has become quite notorious, it got covered actually in the Mumbai Age, we did a very nice piece about three women artists that we featured. We featured um, uh, Man Manhula Padmanaban. Manjula. Manjula Padmanaban. Manjula Padmanaban. Manjula Padmanaban. Manjula Padmanaban. Yeah. I can say that one, yeah. She's very good, so cute. I didn't, we just dis kind of discovered her, someone suggested her, and we thought, why are we, why are we, why do we, it's just a, it's a very, she's a best kept secret. Right, right. Very clever, funny, satirical stuff. We actually interviewed her for the first time. Uh, for the first time. Yeah, I saw you interview in this one. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking to read it. And she's, she's very personable, mm. very funny on email. We got great, com great uh, com uh, correspondence. So yeah, we featured her. And then the other two women we put in from, Germany, from, from India were from Drawing the Line, and I can't remember I their names right now. Kaveri yeah. And uh, Rishu Singh. Exactly, Rishu Singh. And they're really tremendous, tremendously important book. We didn't put Amruta Patil in. I know Deb Kumar, if he's watching this, is going to be saying, you didn't put Amruta Patil in. <laughs> and we lo I love Amruta Patil. And we we've invited her to London. She's done mm -hmm. stuff with us before. We've exhibited her before. But yeah, but uh, in the end, we only got 100. And in the end, there were so many factors and so many themes we were trying to fill uh, right. to make sure we, we had enough material. So, and obviously it's a show that could be, you have a, you have a thousand, mm -hmm. you can have ten thousand, probably. Right. And the idea with Comics Creatrix is we want it to travel, not as a show, because the show is, this show we've done is, is made for Britain, yeah. but we want the concept and the mission and the idea behind it to go to wherever it can. 
because we think it's important for to both to promote and encourage new women coming into comics now, who are working now, but also just to realise that they are part of a tradition. There were people before them, and to link those people up. So on the opening night, for example, of, the, of Comics Treasures, we had, it was really moving. We had young women who hadn't really ever met the, the women who had pioneered these comics in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And several of those women from that period, from, you know, from the past, hadn't been given credit at the time, had never been written about before in the history books. I mean, I'm guilty of that. I've written history books and I've left them out uh, because they're often you know, hidden away in magazines right. that you didn't know about. So, and they were able to meet and they were able to realize, hey, we're actually, there's a, ge there's a, there's a generational thing here where, where we're part of something. We have a legacy. We can build on that. And that I think is inspiring. And it ought to hope it, every country could do that. I mean, some more than others. But, and if you can't do it with what you have here, then you bring in the material from abroad. But already we've had requests for comics creatrix to travel around. And the idea now we're saying is that, no, make your own. Do your own comics. Mm -hmm. Call it that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a hundred. But call it comics creatrix and bring the, the living survivors, you know, the, 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 the veteran pioneers, right. and the history that's been forgotten together with the current women. Well, that's all I was planning on asking you. Yeah, yeah, we need Do you actually plan on taking the exhibition? Hello? It's not. It won't tour. It can't mm. really. Tour. Partly because of the loans. We we, right. we borrowed material from all over the world, mm -hmm. so it's just too complex for it to. We got so much press. It's not just facts international because at the time in mm. January of this year, the Angoulême Festival I mentioned to you, they uh, announced their nominations. You might have heard they have a Grand Prix, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And the list came out of 30 names, and there wasn't a single woman on that list. And it's quite, it's complicated why that happened. There are all sorts of reasons why it happened. But in the end, of course, it, it was a, it caused a scandal. The, pre the, the media coverage, in many ways, I have one funny feeling, it might have been a very clever bit of publicity. By making such a bad this choice, um, they got so much criticism, they got more <laughs> talked about than they'd ever been before. I mean, the festival doesn't normally get this much coverage ahead, but it's not true, of course. Um, but uh, no, because I've got to the last stages, I've just seen the 320 <laughs> pages of the next book that I've tried to write. I'm not even sure what, what we've really made with this book, but the book's going to be called Mangasia. It's Manga and Asia together. Uh, because, as you know, I did do a book about, that's the book there, I did a book on manga in 2004, but um, that obviously is well out of date now. It's still quite good, but it's out of date. And when the publisher came back to me and said, well, we want a new book on manga, I said, well, I, I could, maybe I should have said, yeah, fine, we'll do it. But I wanted to actually get the chance to write about other comic cultures from Asia, not just Japan. So the deal, in a, if in a way, the concept became manga plus Asia. So manga is at least a third of the book, but it's also manga in the Asian context, what effect it's having when it gets exported, if it gets adopted or adapted, or sometimes because it gets, it actually creates a kind of a reverse effect and gets rejected because people want to come up with their own stuff or find their own traditions that they're being kind of overwhelmed by whether it's American or Japanese influence, they want to find what's ours, what's, so in India that's happening. You've got in, artists going back to other drawing styles and storytelling forms that are, that are not Western or not Japanese, but are their own thing. Um, and so the book's quite exciting. I mean, um, and it includes stuff that I've not seen written about in English anyway very much. We've got, I've got, I'm, I've made connections to many countries, not all of them. There are countries I'm still struggling to make any connection with. One is Lao, which was, of course, called Laos originally. Lao. But if anyone knows anybody in Lao, LAO, that's making comics, not just, you know, buying in comics, but pre pre made ones. But we've, well, the book will include stuff from North Korea, for example, North Korean communist propaganda comics, which are amazing. They're really, really interesting. And I found this incredible Australian academic called Jack, actually, Australian Dutch called Jaco Svetsluk, living in Leiden in Holland, who's been studying these extraordinary comics and has given me lots of, lots of access. I also found an amazing collector in Paris who's got the biggest collection of comics from the Philippines. And what you may not realize, the Philippines comics, well, you may not, if you've read American comics, then you've seen people like Nestor Redondo, Alfredo Alcala, who inked John Buscema on Conan, you know, that, that incredible artwork? Well, he's, he's, he was from the Philippines. And they've got that whole huge school of fantastic illustrations a lot of it coming out of the great classic masters of America like Lion Decker and Alex Raymond and all of those. Um, and their comic culture was so huge that at least half or so of almost all movies in the Philippines were based on comics. 
and they used to be so coordinated. I mean, we're talking about we're looking at Hollywood and Superman versus Batman and or whatever, Batman versus Superman, whatever. <laughs> that they obviously are around, but back, the Philippines were getting on with it back in the 50s and 60s, much in even even more sophisticated ways. They would be serializing a story in a weekly comic for maybe five or six page episode, they would hook the readers, but from the beginning, the, 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 the story would have been sold to a movie studio, so that the movie would come out just as the story was getting near the end. So you had to go to the movie, because the story hadn't appeared in print, but you'd been all ready for it every week you were reading the new episodes. There were often fairly cheesy kind of romances and stuff, but there are some really strange ones. There's one called Double Trouble, literally Double Trouble, about um, Siamese twins, conjoined twins, who try uh, um, who have uh, try to have uh, separate romantic affairs, and it's, it's very complicated. Um, and the, the cover we're showing is a wonderful cover. It's uh, it's just got them uh, sitting on the operating table, and then the, behind in a, there's a mad nurse cackling with a big face, and then across between, sort of slicing between them, is a kind of slightly ghostly saw. So they're going to be. It's just fabulously strange cover. And uh, I haven't found the movie that one, but they, they there were. They, this was a whole industry. And what's clever about it, of course, is that when the movie were advertised, it would say Mars Ravello was the big writer, Mars Ravello's whatever the title would be, so, and it was as seen in Tagalog, Tagalog comics or Filipino comics, whatever, it would actually be, so the, the, the comic would promote the movie, the movie would promote the comic, which is just the same way that manga has worked so successfully, is that it's a whole synergy between the two. Um, so I think that that's a whole culture, that's enough there for a whole book in itself. So how familiar are you with the Indian comics uh, Sorry? history and scene? Yeah? Indian comics history yeah. and scene. How familiar are you with that? Well, Rajesh, Rajesh is just giving me this wonderful one here, <laughs> which I think... Um, I want to see a movie of this one. <laughs> Isn't that a spectacular cover? <laughs> it probably is much... It's not going to be so good inside. You just know, don't you? <laughs> the cover's good, but it's not going to be so good inside, really. <laughs> and, does, and does this scene even appear I mean, inside? You know, if you want cross comics like that. But, um, yeah, I think that's... It's, it's, I love that kind of completely... Well, it's not very well done, but it's done with conviction. <laughs> and I think that's, the, that's important. You have to believe in it. This person really believes in what they're doing here. It's not, it's not just to sell. It's done with, with great, great enjoyment. Um, so, yeah, I do know a bit. But again, I'm limited because of language, and limited because I don't, right. yeah, I don't read all the other, other languages. So my friend Rajesh was telling me about uh, Tamil cowboy comics, which I've just glimpsed at. Um, and I know there's many other unusual genres. I'm, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm particularly more alert, I guess, to some of the new graphic novels that come through. So some of the stuff is on these shelves here, like Sanath Banerjee and Vishwajoti mm -hmm. Ghosh, and I wish I could I mentioned already, and, and Barutha, who, Barutha here, who's here, I think, as well. So, yeah, it's people that are they're making the stuff now, but it's also often, often in English. Of course, that helps. But I thought it was interesting. I was talking to my the, the taxi driver on the way over here, and I said, "So, do you read any comics?" And he didn't really. He just not just he said just say no. He couldn't seem to really understand what I meant by comics. It wasn't a language thing. It's because comics really weren't in his culture. They weren't really something that it's he all, would. Also, largely because comics in general are kind of looked at something which only kids. Exactly. Read. You still exactly. have that. Mindset here. Yeah, you know, yeah. After a certain age, you grow past it. Right. So, even if you would have said yes, he probably would have said that. Yeah, I read it as a kid. Uh, exactly. Or, you know, my son. Uh, yeah, yeah. Himself. It's a really good conversation stopper, isn't it? I mean, in, in Britain, if you ask a, a taxi driver, you say, "Did you read comics?" Yeah, I used to read the Beano, and then, and then that's that's it. You know, they're not going to have. And it'd be like saying, "Yeah, I haven't seen. I, I used. To, yeah, I've. I, I used to watch um, Disney movies. I used to watch um, Jungle Book, and that's the only film I've ever watched." You know, it'd be like that, wouldn't it? It'd be like right. um, the only book I've ever read is, is a children's book. I've read right. Alice in Wonderland when I was ten, and I haven't read a single book since. You think, what? What's wrong with you? <laughs> but it, with comics, that's what people like, essentially are saying. I have not read them since I was small. Yeah, yeah. they're missing so much. Even all of the adult comics, they move in very small low. Circles out here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not, I guess, it's, and, it, and also the graphic novels are quite mm. expensive, yeah. and they're not going to be mass market. So, I mean, that's the question for for how. What, what do you think the, the the evolution of Indian comics is going to need right now <laughs> to, 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 to get to, to connect to the public? Because the trouble is actually the public. Probably the internet is making mm. a difference. That's obviously it gets stuff out to people free, right? And you can bring people in that way. But you're it's easier to reach yeah. people, but it doesn't necessarily help with the commerce of. Uh, no. Comics once again. No. It still involves right. a lot of effort in you know mm -hmm. printing it out, sending it to people, mm. and stuff. I, well, I imagine the audience that's coming in through the movies, mm. going to Comic Con, 
they are going to be going, okay, I like this stuff, but what else is there? And right. you can hopefully get their attention. You would expect that to be the way it happens. Yes. Right. There are people who can kind of say yeah. that's not necessarily how it uh, no. happens. No. Well, they will, they're going to compare your stuff to the glossy, full color, professional stuff, right. and more importantly, the familiar characters right. that they want to plug into. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and you haven't quite, you haven't got quite the publishing, sorry, the advertising budget yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. You're not I don't think them, you will no. see independent comics here with any kind of advertisements. No. Everything is all self-published or mm, mm. venture. Mm, mm. But I think there's hope. But the point is, as I said at the beginning, there is nothing wrong with whatever you choose to read in comics. And the only thing I don't want to do is to come, come, come over with some kind of someone who's saying, that's the bad stuff, this right. is the good stuff. Because, and that, you know, we can all find something that gives, that we enjoy. And whatever it is you enjoy is great. It's just a shame that there are people that aren't even enjoying any comics. So if I have anything, I, I find, I, there must be a way to get everybody to, to at least sample one. Uh, if, they, if they can just open, open the comic and open their mind. Thank you for listening. I'm so amazed you've all stayed as well. My God. Thank you.